if you can tell anyone on the street now that inflation is an English and money supply, they will offer to you. They actually hijacked the definition of the term there. <laughs> and now there isn't actually a term for the increase in money supply. <laughs> so yeah, I mean, that's one of the most things. Yeah, those greedy capitalists are price gorging again, and now everything is more expensive. <laughs> that's exactly what the, the people in power, the banks and, and your government want you to think. All right, André van Heerden, welcome to Bitcoin for Millennials. Thanks, Ram. No, thanks for having me. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on. I uh, I think it's very cool. You are from South Africa and just in general, you know, I think uh, Bitcoin is already the network state, right? There's Bitcoiners everywhere. So I think it's really cool to talk to uh, someone from uh, from your neck of the woods. I uh, I wanted to start with, uh, yeah, your Bitcoin journey. You've been in Bitcoin since 2018. And um, yeah, could you share a bit about how your journey went and also how your perspective changed over time? Yes, I, I was a complete normie. I thought I knew everything there was to know about business and um, economics. And I stumbled across uh, the Bitcoin standard by Seferin. And um, it like completely blew my mind when I read it the first time. It answered so much, so many questions that I've um, inherently I, I struggled with it in my head, that I, but I never really realized it. And it just opened a new world for me. And since then, I, I, I've basically been a full-time Bitcoiner, um, trying to work in the Bitcoin space, trying to write, um, trying to study more, and um, ended up going very deep down the Austrian economics rabbit hole, and obviously with Bitcoin with that. And um, trying to be an evangelist for, for Bitcoin and Austrian economics in the world. And um, so I've recently started this um, new um, business, um, AirBTC, and so far it's going quite well. And I'm finally, uh, I can dedicate my full time to a Bitcoin only project. Yeah, very cool. What what were the questions that that were answered in the Bitcoin standard that you didn't realize you had? So I mean, um, usually. Inflation has always been a big topic. Um, I mean, I think it's a big topic in everyone's life and everyone thinks that they know what's going on with inflation. But the way the Austrian economists explain it just gives you a much deeper insight and you realize that what everything that you thought caused inflation, inflation and the general inflation um, measures and everything is... Um, so, so, I mean, you I always knew that the inflation rate that the government puts out there is nonsense and that the basket is nonsense. But I, I mean, you, you, you kind of always have struggled with what's really going on there uh, because you can feel the inflation in the economy is more than, than the number that's printed in the economic um, re research. And I mean, that blew my mind just to, if we, the, the first time that I realized that the, the expansion in money supply is that's what inflation actually is. <laughs> and then I, I, I mean, if you, if you go a bit deeper into the, into Austrian economics rabbit hole, um, you realize that, um, like before the 1960s, basically, inflation, the term inflation meant <laughs> increase in money, money, money supply. That was what, um, inflation, um, yeah. what the definition of inflation was. And it somehow during the seventies got hijacked and inflation now means whatever the CPI is. And if you go and tell anyone on the street now that inflation is the English and money supply, they will offer to you. They actually hijacked the definition of the term there. <laughs> and now there isn't actually a term for the increase in money supply. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah. Well, I mean, they that's conflated what the two things on purpose, right? Yeah. Like it's inflating the money supply, therefore debasing the existing units that were already there, right? Of, of a yeah, currency. Exactly. And the result is inflated prices, just nominal uh, prices, because the, the units became worth less, right? But now, yeah, everyone thinks that inflation is just prices going up because lots of other reasons besides printing more money. Yeah, those greedy capitalists are price gorging again and now yeah, everything exactly. is really expensive. <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, that's exactly what the, what the, the, the people in, in, in power, um, the, the banks and, the, and, and your government wants you to think. They have all the universities and all the uh, uh, learned people um, all the journalists and they're just writing that um, these uh, these evil companies are basically causing inflation because they are trying to up their profits. Uh, but in the meantime, I mean, it's it, it just makes so much sense. I mean, I, I think 
I think a four-year-old could understand that if you have a certain amount of goods in an economy and you have a certain amount of money in an economy and the goods stays the same and the money becomes more, <laughs> then, yeah. then, 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 then the goods will, will the, the same amount of money will buy less goods. I mean, that's, that's, it's, it's so intuitive. Um, it's one of the simplest concepts, I think, to grasp. Um, you don't really need, um, high school economics to, to, to be able to understand that. Yeah. So, uh, the, the illustration that I really like uh, that I once saw, like the animation is just like a scale that is even, right? And you have the goods and the amount of money. And if you create more money, it, it, it gets more heavy, right? And then, that one, that side goes down and the goods go up. Right. And so I always thought that was like a nice, um, visualization, but yeah, what's, what, what was then the aha moment? Like you, you read the book, there were some explanations for things you thought you understood before, but you, you saw the answers to the questions and you were like, okay, that, that makes way more sense. And it also shows in history, right? I find that fascinating. By the way, there's so many examples of, how bad this is in history, but it's like we've collectively forgotten that there's a history of money and that the money that we currently have it is only 50 ish years years old, right? Yeah, what what was what was then the aha moment? Is that something you can remember? Yeah, I mean I distinctly remember um this, uh, evening I was lying in bed and reading the Big Western and at that stage I was only like a third of the way through <laughs> and um it was one point in the book where um i already had a lot of um like very interesting revelations that i thought was 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 excellent but there was one point in the book where um Seferin describes he, he was talking about um john maynard keynes and uh, basically how the keynesians came up with the idea that money printing is necessary so it's basically always no matter what the problem um, in the in the world is, the the answer for that is always to print more money. <laughs> and now, I, mean, I, I, th I think during World War One and World War Two, those were real problems, and the only solutions that they could find was to print money because they had to basically um, in order to fund the war. I mean, whether whether it was really necessary for the US and England to get involved in any of those two wars um, is a side point. But they had real crises, if you want to call it that, on hand. But as anyone who has read the Bitcoin standard would know, is if you, if you stop that that process, you, you can never turn back. So, so you can never get deflation, and that's um, because the whole, the, the whole thing will will, will collapse on its um, on itself. Um, you have to you have to keep on expanding the money supply, otherwise the existing loans will won't be able to get paid back because there won't be enough money in existence to repay those loans. So now, basically, what they're doing is they it seems like that's true that um, that they create new crises in order to print the money to solve those crises. But yeah. those, the newly printed money never solves the, 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 those crises. But, um, I mean, there's, there's never a shortage of reasons to, 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 to print more. Um, the governments and banks around the world always, always find new ones. I mean, one of the greatest scams is this, the, the whole green tax and climate um, disaster um, well, it is a total disaster for, for the world economy because it's just, um, um, I mean, if, if, even if it was true that pollution is, 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 is causing uh, climate change, why should you pay your government more money that went, that went up, solve that problem? <laughs> I mean, mm. it's, it's ridiculous. <laughs> um, so, I mean, <laughs> yeah, no matter what the problem is, the answer is always, um, print more, more money, <laughs> give us <Yeah>. more money. <laughs> Does your Bitcoin custody setup keep you up at night? Gain peace of mind with OnRamp and their multi-institution custody solution. OnRamp creates a dedicated multi-signature vault for you and three separate institutions each hold a key, which are OnRamp, Bitco, and CoinCover. But none of them can move funds unilaterally, only you have control. These institutions can only sign with your instruction. OnRamp's multi-institution custody eliminates single points of failure, reduces your personal attack service and technical burden, and provides access to financial services that allow you to secure your Bitcoin, including inheritance planning, insurance-backed warranties for all balances and transactions, low-cost trading, and more. Check out onrampbitcoin.com through my link in the description below and receive $250 in Bitcoin when you join. If you want to self-custody your Bitcoin stack, I recommend the Foundation Passport, a premium Bitcoin-only hardware wallet. I've been using mine for about a year now, and I love the design and ease of use. And with Foundation's mobile wallet companion app Envoy, your initial onboarding is super smooth and straightforward. 
The Passport is fully air-gapped, which means you never have to connect it to the internet or any computer. The Passport serves as a signing device to sign transactions on your Envoy app or any of your other favorite software wallets like Sparrow or Blue Wallet. The Foundation Passport also offers encrypted backups on a microSD card and is built with 100% open source hardware and software. I love what Zach and the team at Foundation are building. And to learn more about their mission, please check out episode 27 of this podcast. If you consider buying a Foundation Passport, you can use code BRAM, that's B-R-A-M, to get $10 off at foundation.xyz slash BRAM. Yeah. Well, it, it's interesting, right? Because I like the example of the war example is really good because before when there was a hard currency or, or countries or factions had gold and, and a limited supply of men, they would not fight endless wars, right? There's like these examples of battles where, you know, if one faction got the, the, the upper hand and it seemed like the other faction was losing, the, the, the losing faction would come to agreements uh, and eventually uh, concede, right? Because they had just limited amounts of men and limited amounts of, of gold or money to, to, to pay the men and, 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 you know, pay for the weapons and, and all these things. Yeah. Which makes once you perfect lose, sense. That gold is gone. <laughs> exactly. And, yeah. and so that, that makes perfect sense. Right. But, uh, what you just said in the beginning triggered a, a, a thought in me. It's like, if you want to pay for something you cannot have, you just create money if you can. Right. Like, uh, it makes, it makes total sense. And I think it's like how children grow up and they want something, right? And you say, well, if you don't have the money, you cannot buy it, right? But if you <laughs> can create the money, then then you can do anything you want. And of course, it looks great. I mean, we see the promises of, of Harris in the States with you know, um, student loan debt, uh, uh, erasing that, you know, uh, giving money and people $25,000 to buy a home because the home prices are so high, right? It's very, uh, and I don't know if your background is in economics or finance, mine is not. So, and, and I think it's good because I'm not tainted by this other thinking, but if I read Austrian economics stuff or the Bitcoin standard, I'm like, yeah, this this makes sense. Like if you cannot pay, for, if, if you don't have the money, you cannot have it. Right. And well, if you can print money and then get it, you have to be honest about what the um, consequences are of creating more units of a currency. Right. And I think that's where the deceit comes in. That's where mm-hmm. like the, uh, you know, the, the changing definition of inflation comes from or the changing, um, identification of the causes of the inflation or pointing the fingers at the companies, you know, um, that are, that are, um, putting the prices higher and just saying like, yeah, that's, it's, it's their fault, right? It's, it's like a, this endless spiral of, yeah, continuous deceit basically. Yes. I mean, a, a, a big part of, of, of Keynesian economics is not taking into account all the consequences of a certain action. So, um, yeah. I mean, any, basically any government intervention, they would always publicize all the good that, that intervention, um, 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 is supposedly, uh, 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 gonna do. Um, but you never hear a word about the possible other, other effects, which, I mean, an economy is a, a living organism, basically. Anything that you do to that, to, 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 an, to economy has multiple effects. It, so, so, I mean, if you, I mean, like price controls, um, I mean, that's a good example. I mean, there's a book. It's called 400 cents. Yeah. 400 centuries of, of price controls. It's like a 400 and something pages. And it has like hundreds of examples of throughout history for the last 4,000 years of governments doing price controls. <laughs> it's always because they're trying to stop inflation. <laughs> yeah. But and it, every single time, every single instance that they could find, it had devastating consequences. It never, it never stopped inflation. I mean, the, the biggest thing that it always does is it, it stops production because <laughs> if it doesn't pay to produce, if, if it costs you more to produce a unit than you're able to sell it for, you're not just going to stop. Um, yeah. So, 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 <laughs> yeah, so, so, so I mean, you, you bring in price controls within two yeah. years, all the shelves are empty. The, those uh, goods that you put the price controls on just basically it goes out of existence. And then the next thing, but well, luckily I, I don't think we'll get to that, um, um, in our time, but up until like a uh, hundred years ago, 
um, let me rather say two hundred years ago, what they would then do is they would force people to 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 keep keep on producing or kill you basically or put you in jail if you sell at a higher price, <laughs> or or if you have if you're if you're a merchant and you have some goods and you're not selling at the price that they're telling you, they would confiscate it and sell it, or they would put you in jail or whatever, and um. So, I mean, now, even now, I mean, it's, it's so ridiculous. I mean, there's like, there's literally hundreds of examples. I'm just going to mention one book, but, um, and I mean, I don't think that anyone can point to a, to an instance where a government has tried to, to implement price controls and it was good. It had a net good effect. I just mentioned that the goods go off the shelves and that's one of the negative effects, but it's devastating to people and to an economy. Yeah. And so, I mean, so even today, a lot of politicians in Europe and in the US, I think, I think even Kamala Harris, they're talking about implementing price controls. I mean, it's so insane. Well, if, if <laughs> you see her. The, the negative yeah. into account at all, that only looking at, at, at the, the one track, we, we're going to cap the price at X and, um, it's not, it, and then the inflation is stopped. They just don't even take into account that it doesn't work like that. Yeah. No, I agree. If you, if you, there was just one video where Harris was asked about this, like, how, how are you going to pay for everything? So this was not about the price controls, right? But all these other measurements. And she was like, yeah, the, um, it's going to pay for itself. That was her, that, that was her talking point. She said it like seven times in, in, in like, uh, four minutes. But I think what, what is most important is that there's no, there's no conversation about it, right? Like their pitch is, High price bad, we make high price go down or something like that. <laughs> uh, so vote, so vote for me, right? Yeah, and we're going to print more money to make those prices go down. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. They, they, they don't say that part, right? Yeah. But it feels like there's no, there's no conversation around. If I do this policy, then this is the effect, right? If if I do policy B, then this is the effect, and. It's, as you said, I agree. Um, this was one of my eye openers actually, because when I had like economics in high school, right, you were calculating stuff. And, uh, but when I realized it's basically a social science, as you said, it's, it's like this organism, right? It's like this pool of incentives where, where people communicate with each other and in freedom agree to the value communicated by a certain price, right? To, to be exchanged be between, um, each other and what i don't understand is how so many people still believe that if other people put up rules to make other people you and me behave in a certain way which will be good for everyone who is participating in this crazy organism yeah that that's a good thing Right. That that is not a, 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 a free market because actually, if they would allow a free market, right, yeah. um, a, a, a lot of the things that they are protecting that are, you know, zombie companies and stuff like that, the treasuries. Yeah, th that, that would be killed. Right. So yeah. they have to hold up this facade of the, the only way is up, basically. I mean, you saw that with the crash. With the, with the carry trade, right? Like the S&P went down 10% and there were PhDs on TV screaming uh, for uh, regulations and all, all all this stuff. Like it can't go down. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, the, the best for me is, is, is always, um, I mean, every year, uh, every quarter, basically there's, there's new regulations, new laws, new everything coming mm. out. But there's no laws ever being scrapped. I mean, <laughs> you've never heard of a, of, a, of a government uh, 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 scrapping a law. I mean, wh why would they um, curtail their own power? I mean, it's so ridiculous. I mean, there's some there's some towns in the US and in England, and there's still districts where it's like illegal to ride a horse with your hat on and stuff like that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah. they, they, they haven't even scrapped those laws. I mean, just in case they need to enforce it someday. <laughs> yeah, it's fascinating. I think that's a very interesting point. Actually, there's, there's, I, I haven't seen that. That's a really good point, you know, where they communicated like, well, we had this policy, this didn't work. So we're going to scrap it. But I think usually it gets like over, overturned with the introduction of a, of a new policy, probably. So they never have to yeah. confess, yeah, I think confess that to, so. to another policy failing. Yeah. And I mean, so if something gets really outdated, they, it, they just basically just stop enforcing it. Um, I've seen yeah. that happen in South Africa a lot. I mean, it's, it's, it's still a law, but no one yeah. basically cares about it. <laughs> and so when you, when you had these insights, you read the book, you, you dove deeper down the, the Austrian topic, right? That rabbit hole. 
how how has Bitcoin changed your life? You said you were a total normie. Now you're a full on Bitcoin uh, uh, maximalist. W- what has changed there? I think a lot has changed for me. It, it was a slow and gradual process of uh, uh, enlightenment, if you want to call it that. But um, I found that Safedin, especially, so I subscribed to his programs on safedin.com and became a member of um, the community there and did all these courses. You know, back when I started, he only had so one course and, and the Bitcoin standard. And I remember that, I mean, back even back then, um, his ideas and theories about this these things were radical. Um, the Austrian schools were like very, very um, 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 little known um, small school of economics before Safety came, came along. I mean, in the US, they, they have the Mises Institute, but they're also not, I mean, they're not in the mainstream. And Safety basically, so, so, so it was basically like a couple of very old gold bulls that still kept Austrian economics going and a couple of like radical free market people in the US. But I think Safety came along and brought the whole thing into, um, into the public's eye through Bitcoin as well. So then Safety started, uh, expanding his, uh, the range of topics that he talks about. Uh, for me, I mean, the first thing was the, the climate um, hysteria scam, basically. Then COVID came and Safedin was uh, like anti lockdown and anti mask mandates and uh, anti vax, like from, from day one. And so I was still at that stage eating up the, the media's, uh, um, narrative as it was fed to me, basically. And when Safedin started saying those things, I was like, Oh, wh- wh- wow. <laughs> um, <laughs> and that's interesting. So, so, so they're lying to us. Um, you know, and, and, um, well, in retrospect, it turns out like all of that was true. And then Safedin came with the carnival diet, which was also the first time that I heard about it, like a uh, very radical. <laughs> and, um, but, um, to me, that, uh, that, that spoke quite, um, touched quite close to my heart because our culture, Afrikaans culture in South Africa, we are meat lovers. So a lot of Afrikaans people, my ancestors, my uh, grandparents uh, come from a farming lifestyle. Grandmother would, she would eat <laughs> uh, like a homemade bread. And then they would take um, lamb tallow and put it on top of it as butter, but they would put it on it like uh, a half a centimeter thick. And that was breakfast, <laughs> like two two of those. <laughs> <laughs> and my grandmother was never in hospital in her entire life, and she died at 97. So, I mean, when Safedin started with the, the whole um, saturated fat isn't unhealthy for you, that I, I already had a lot of examples throughout my own life. That that was should be true because at one point in I mean like in 2021 I think it reached its, its pinnacle but I mean saturated fats was is so bad that I, if you basically order a steak and there's like a piece of fat on the side no matter how small my wife or my mother would say like um, no you uh, you can't eat that you must you're gonna get a heart attack you must cut that off <laughs> I mean that's how vilified it, it's become over the last uh, 40 years. Um, which also, I mean, now, um, since, since I, I heard that revelation from Safedin, um, I started researching that as well. I've, not only me, but I mean, the, the, the carnival diet and the, 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 the saturated fat is unhealthy myth has been, I think, very largely debunked. I, I think that the, the, I mean, the Rubicon has been crossed. Um, I think more people that I meet now believe that it's healthy than, than people that think that it's unhealthy. Yes, I mean, all those changes in life through the Bitcoin rabbit hole <laughs> has been uh, incredible for me, <laughs> like op- eye opening. And also, um, just, uh, I mean, general, um, low time preference living. Um, I have a child now. I don't think, I mean, I probably would have looked at it differently. Um, becoming a father. I mean, having hope for the future is a big thing. Um, I mean, back, I, mean, I can't even, ima- can you imagine how someone who hasn't discovered Bitcoin and, doesn't understand that the governments are trying to exploit us for tax and see it, see that there's a hope on the other side of that. I can't imagine how people of, of our age, like in, in their thirties or twenties can, can live. I, I mean, I can understand why they don't, don't want to have children because they don't want to raise children mm-hmm. in a, in a basically in a world without hope because yeah. everything just looks like it's going to shit. But, but I mean, this has given me hope and um, understanding that there, that there is a possibility for us to, to beat this. And to come out on the other side, a better society, a wealthier society, and a more free society. Yeah. 
can we dive in on that? Because I think that's a very important point, especially for millennials. And I, I mean, I have exactly the same. I feel I, I would not know where I would be without Bitcoin, to be honest. But as you said, outlook on the future, uh, extending a family, building a home or stuff like that, like all, all the stuff that you would think you would be doing at the age of, let's say, 28 to 37, 8, something like that, right? So I think the millennial, the millennial prime age. Yeah, I, I don't know where my, what my mental state would be, but I think what Bitcoin brings me is a lot of hope, as you said, for the future and also learning that it's, uh, what I like is this term about discounting the future. That's also something that Safe Dean says, right? Like the future is uncertain for everyone. So that's a given, right? And and therefore we discount the future over over the present. So we focus a lot on the present. Of course, you have to live in the present. But what he means by that is that if you want to build towards something, you have to take a risk into this unknown uh, future, right? And in order to build something, you need to have time or or assets, right? Or capital to to actually get there. But the capital also buys you the time, right? So the, the thing you basically need is capital. Um, depending on what you want to do, you have to have X amount of capital, right? Like it doesn't matter what you want to do, but if you want to build towards something in the future, you need some sort of capital to either buy time or buy stuff or uh, hire people to to do that for you, right? And I think that is where a lot of people get this pessimism from right or the and 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 therefore also the nihilistic look towards the future is that they are not even able to save capital with the money that they they are forced to use right I, and i think eventually it is that that simple but i think a lot of a lot of people as the ones that i talk to but i'd love to hear from you like I always say like everything you would ever want to fix in the world is caused by the money that is broken right so you can be an advocate for whatever subject you have to realize that it is because the money is broken. And if you want to be an advocate for your own life and build your own life and have like positive outlook on the uncertain future that is uncertain for everyone, you, you have to understand that you are not able to do it because of the money that, that you use. Right. And, um, I think that's just a really hard conversation to have. Yeah, and um, I mean, like I, I, I look around at my friends, the people of my age, and um, I mean, there's not a lot of of them who own their own properties, their own homes, and I mean, that's understandable. It's it's, it's almost impossible to save, especially in South Africa. I mean, that depends on from on country to country, but I mean, if 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 you if you have a good job and you man, you you can save up and you can invest, um, it's very hard to beat inflation. I mean, the last the last three years, I mean, since basically since the 2001 a run up and no one no one has beaten um inflation almost and then um, i mean the fees on these um, investment schemes that it's i mean in south africa it's ridiculous then if if you manage to actually come close to beating inflation after paying the fees which is i mean very rare the government still comes and takes <laughs> capital gains tax like 25 <laughs> percent it's so ridiculous so i mean it just doesn't make sense why would you why would you then say we rather just go on holiday you know why, why would you um, yeah, um exactly. and then, and then yeah. you realize oh well well i can't um I, if i can't save up how, how am i going to raise a child and it costs uh whatever about 150 euros a year to raise a child how, how am i going to do that one day I can barely, barely feed myself so i mean i can understand why well, a lot of people don't want to get have children and it's, it's a huge leap financially. Um, and I mean, the higher the inflation and the least, I mean, it, the least people get into a solid middle class and those people start falling down in, in, out of middle class basically. And they kind of are incapable of having children and the population starts declining and the whole thing can yeah. quick, very quickly start spiraling out of control. As the the debt and the money gets more and the and the population in the country gets less, I mean that it can very quickly the whole thing can collapse. Yeah. So how do you experience talking with with your fellow millennial friends then about money, finance, Bitcoin? Like, are you having these conversations? Are they interested in in learning about what is going on? 
Yes, well, I do have a group of friends that um, basically that's also in the finance industry uh, that know their stuff about uh, finance and economics. And th- that's always a very interesting conversation. They always um, ask me a lot of questions. And then they always like, listen, and then they have like uh, a couple of quirks about Bitcoin or whatever, or make a joke. But I mean, the general turn of the conversation is is, is usually uh, uh, they're asking questions they want to learn. But I mean... That's like 10% of the people out there, 90% of the people that I meet on the street, they just don't have any clue. They just want to do their job or whatever that might be, whether it's a teacher or a manager in a restaurant or whatever it is. Um, they don't know and they don't care about these, these type of stuff. And I mean, that's also one of the points that safety always makes is, I mean, the butcher must be a butcher and the teacher must be a teacher. Why should they also have to um, exactly be, yeah. be a professional investor and know all this stuff about finance? And I mean, because everyone has to now, they all basically need financial advisors. And these people are taking two and 20 basically <laughs> of, of, of all the, if they actually manage to, 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 to make you, um, inflation related returns. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so it's before they're cut, up. before they're cut yeah. <laughs> or after they're cut. I mean, yeah. Yeah. Mm. And what's, so I think, uh, yeah, again, like I don't have an economics background, so I didn't know about Keynesian Austrian, but yeah, like, so when I read the Austrian stuff, it makes a lot of sense to me. What do you think is the number one thing that people need to understand are the differences between Austrian and, and Keynesian economics, knowing that, you know, Keynesian economics, or maybe for some people listening, learning that Keynesian economics basically uh, rule our economy, right? It's uh, it's 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 the, the the ideology or the uh, the ideas of Keynesian economics that that run our current economy, whereas Austrian economics are uh, economists are probably totally uh, one eighty degrees opposed to to the Keynesian tactics. Could you share a bit about that and um, yeah, what you think is the most important thing people need to understand? Um, I think that that. Um the, for the normal people on the street, they would consider um, socialism or communism basically on the one side of the spectrum and capitalism on the other side. And the debate is always between those two. But um, I think what a lot of people don't understand is um, that what we consider capitalism in today's um, school of thought or, or, or in today's economy if, if, uh, well, today's economy is capitalism. Yeah. Is if you look on a on a scale of that big, you have socialism here, then you have Keynesian capitalism, like basically right next to it, and then on the basically on the other side of a football field, that's that's <laughs> what a real free market capitalism is like. Yeah. So yeah. we're yeah. very close to to the, the, what we are calling capitalism in today's uh, world is yeah. very close to, to socialism. I mean, um, in, in a complete free market, there would be no regulation and no tax. So, I mean, a person like me in South Africa, we pay close to 80% in total in tax. If you, if you can count everything, like income tax and uh, municipal taxes and um, value added tax and tax on, on, on fuel and um, alcohol and all that stuff. If, if a general person goes and looks at their expenditure and income and see how much of that goes to the government, it's close to 80%. I mean, that means that if you, if you, if you, if you think about it, if, if you work five days a week, <laughs> you're working four days for the government and one day for yourself. I mean, that's just that thought. I mean, that's insane. <laughs> I mean, so, so, so basically that's a bad pitch for working. We're so close to, 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 to socialism here that, and now the people who are real socialists they come and point out. <laughs> Look how bad this capitalist system is. <laughs> and in the meantime, it's, it's because it's basically 80% socialism at this stage and mm. the real free market, like what the Austrians would, 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 would describe as a, as a free market is w- way different of what we're seeing today. I mean, if you take away all the restrictions of trade in the world, you take away, um, the printing of currencies from governments and banks. You allow people to freely trade between each other without restrictions. I think there will be no poverty in the world within 10 years, basically. The technological um, advances will be so insane that the rich will be going to Mars, basically, for holiday, and the poor will be all living in three-bedroom apartments 
over li- with a nice view. That's not far fetched if if you if you just take away the basically theft and in- interference of um, rent seekers, which yeah. is large institutions, um, governments, banks, um, different governing bodies around the world. So yeah, I mean, if, if if someone's listening to this and you think I'm talking nonsense, and I mean, just dive a little bit into Austrian economics, read about it, read um, uh, Rothbard, read uh, The Anatomy of State, um, read The Mystery of Banking. It's not large books. Um, I think Anatomy of State is like 35 pages or something like that. It's all out there. It's 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 easy to grasp. Yeah, yeah. It, wh- while you're talking, I, I again think like, oh, it makes so much sense to me. It's so rational, right? Like why, if, if there are people that put up restrictions for other people on how to trade, they should have a very good explanation for why they would do that, right? Not explaining us from when we are ch- children, right, is one tactic, then, you know, the question never gets asked, right? The question, what is money actually? And what is the effect of it on how we communicate with each other in, well, what we think is a, is a, is a free economy, right? But once you just really, really, really simplify it, right? If the incentive would to be, would just be to make good things or provide good services and you will be rewarded, you know, make good enough products and good enough services, right? So other people want to purchase them, then you will be rewarded. I I think that's the only thing that should exist because it will also give you the freedom to try different things, right? And and kind of like to also test what am I actually good at? And I I use the example of cakes a lot in in the podcast, but yeah, if I have a cake shop and you have a cake shop and you have more customers and I can survive, then yeah, I'm not the person to make cakes, you know, like that's... And that's totally okay. Maybe I'm a carpenter or, you know, a gardener or a teacher or whatever. Right. But now, and, and, and what that would do, by the way, to just your psychology and outlook on life. And if you know that you have the freedom to explore and experience on the road to finding what would be your role to contribute to, to a society, that already sounds way more positive than being put on some sort of path towards, you know, whatever destination that is not even really your own choice uh, of, of, of going on, basically, just because you are yeah, captured in, in, in a certain economic system. And uh, yeah, I don't know. It's just so, why, why isn't there just an open, totally free market? Why, why, why isn't it? If people want to have something, it should exist. If people don't want to have something, it should it should not exist. I don't, I don't know how how it could be so complicated. <laughs> yeah, um, I mean, <laughs> um, I think history. I think I heard Michael Saylor say this once: if you view history through a certain lens, U.S. history, but I think to a very large extent, world history as well. It's basically productive people starting and producing and trading between each other, and then some unproductive people coming and taking from them in some way um, and r- ruling them and extracting rent seeking. And then that starts usually small and then more and more and more. And then eventually it comes to a point where the productive people can't take it anymore. And then they move away to a new area or a new jurisdiction and they start a new colony or country or whatever. And then they flourish there again. And then as soon as they are reaching their Previous guys are poorer, then they come and take them over again. And then yeah. the productive people move on again. And, and so it just keeps on going, going, going. And if you, if you look at history through that lens, basically, you can make a lot of sense. You can see a lot of examples of that happening. And I think that that is also what we're doing with Bitcoin as well now. So the productive class has been extracted from to such an extent over the, the last 40 years that we're coming to a point where it's, it's, it's almost impossible to, to, to keep on and we're going to move away, but not to a new jurisdiction or a new land or a new area, but to a separate economy, basically that's going to be run on Bitcoin. And, um, 
I think I think that's uh, going to happen with the, um, oh, throughout the next 20 years. Yeah. So if someone asks you, what is Bitcoin and why should I care? What is your answer? I always like to to, to describe it as uh, just a, like a decentralized protocol that um, enables anyone to, to use it. And um, to me, the most important aspect of Bitcoin is is the decentralization and the fact that it can't be stopped. And the fact that as long as two people are basically running a node, it'll still be the same. And I always get a lot of, I mean, one of the biggest pushbacks is that there's going to be a new Bitcoin. <laughs> I mean, that's been coming since 2012. Bitcoin is basically the shitcoiners are saying Bitcoin is boomer tech, but um, I mean, Bitcoin will always exist. I mean, if someone can come and change the code and run it on the side, but um, someone will always still be running Bitcoin Core, basically. And um, that means that um, no matter what happens in the future, as long as I can remember my 24 words, those coins are mine. Yeah. I, I think there's a very good explainer, explainer actually. I, I think it's, I, I actually just tweeted so someone say it i'm gonna read it let's see if you agree let me see bitcoin is just a unit of something that promises and verifiably shows it will stay that way yeah <laughs> that's Which basically what i just said but just in one yeah, sentence exa instead of uh, uh, exactly <laughs> yeah but it's 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 so so profoundly simple i think and that's also why it's very hard to understand and it takes time because as we just talked about Right, the, the entire world around you is so obfuscated. It's so abstracted, right? You don't really understand. You don't know what money is. You don't know where it comes from. Sometimes I say the words final settlement to someone and someone's like, what? What, what, what is that <laughs> even? Right. Um, or if you ask, like, what are the characteristics of money? Stuff like that. And so. I think why Bitcoin is so hard to understand is is because it eventually is so profoundly simple. As you said, it is a protocol. It's just a set of rules. And with the validators in the network, right, the nodes and the miners, we check every 10 minutes are the rules still accepted by the majority? Yes, yes, yes. Okay. Then, then we still run these rules. And the output of doing that, the proof of work also, Right. So continuing the, the, the chain of history and the history of transactions, but also reaffirming that the rules are still the rules and that the rules are followed by the participants in the network. The output of that is a constant. It's a, it's a constant thing. And that is what I think eventually creates the value in a, in a world where everything is obfuscated and abstracted and very hard to verify down to the gold that all the central banks have. I think, you know, gold is fine if people like gold, but even the gold, it, there is fake gold and there is paper gold that other people put leverage on and all these things. And, yeah. and, and Bitcoin yeah, is the I mean, only, only real thing, the only real yeah. thing to, to exist. Yes. I mean, even if, even if, uh, uh Central banks allow allow other people inside to go and check if they have the reserves that they say they do. Those gold bars inside there could be tungsten covered in gold. <laughs> they would exactly. have to go and melt it yeah. to be sure. Yeah. Well, <laughs> you need three machines to check. It. Yeah, and so I think what is a nice thought experiment, right? Because some people will listen to this and think like, "Yeah, okay, but the government would never lie. Why would they lie? Like, you know, the gold is there to protect us." And like, but but I think. You don't have to think that other people are lying. Once you understand that there is something exists that you can verify for yourself, you as an individual, once you realize that you can do that with one thing and one thing only, and not with any of the other things that would be an asset class or a money store value and all these things, then, then I think you realize what Bitcoin is, right? That, that, that constant, the, the entire goal of the protocol is to sh show, I still work, I still work, I still work, you know, I'm still the same, I'm still the same. Yeah. That is the point because everything mm. else gets changed all the time. 
Mm. You know, does that make sense? Yeah, ex- <laughs> exactly. And, and uh, I mean, just to, 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 to carry on on that point, the question you asked me earlier about how it changed me, you know, I think that by learning and understanding Bitcoin to such a degree that when I saw what governments and economists and the media were saying about Bitcoin, I knew for a fact that it's nonsense because mm-hmm. I can see that, that, that what they're saying is not true or that they have been misinformed, um, or they know, know, they know what they're talking about and seeing people in those positions speak and you know for a fact that that's not true or that they're lying, that opens you up to the possibility that Oh, wait, there must, might be other stuff that they don't know as well, exactly. that they're lying about as well. But yes. if you never, if you ne- and, and if that doesn't necessarily have, have to be, be Bitcoin for you. I mean, if you're the teacher and you know a lot about a certain, yeah, uh, university or whatever, and someone in the government comes out and they talk about that university and you can say, Oh, well, what they're saying is nonsense. That might be also happened for you or, in the mining industry or yeah. manufacturing, whatever. But I have if you don't have, exact if, same, if, exact same. Yeah, yeah. yeah if, but if you if you don't have expertise in a certain area that they're basically lying about, you're not going to be able to verify for yourself that they're lying. So that Bitcoin did that to me. That like opened up the my mind to the to the idea that I could have been lied to my entire life. Oh, oh, wait, I, I have been lied to my entire life. I think a lot of people out there um, on the street just um that hasn't they haven't had that realization yet because they haven't deep dived into a certain topic to an extent where they can be considered an expert on that yeah yeah i agree i, I had the exact uh exact same uh revelation and i said this before many times but it's um i think bi- what bitcoin showed me is that i can trust myself i can trust my own diligence my own research my own reflection, contemplation, all, all these things to understand this, this one, one topic. And because I know that it takes a lot of work because we are programmed to not know how money works and never question the system, right? It's so weird. Like, okay, we have a system and nobody, or maybe everybody thinks like, this is the best we could ever come up with. So we should never question it it's so weird it's so weird because a lot of other stuff in the news you know it talks about innovation and i don't know new trains or new planes or new boats or whatever like everything is constantly in motion except the system for money that 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 we use <laughs> yeah. right like this, this well, is it like this also is the innovation best. is getting it's getting more and more <laughs> Yeah, well, but, yeah, but it's like this is the best that we could do, and 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 that's what you have to to deal with, right? It, yeah. it also just that thought. Whether you want to study Bitcoin or like Bitcoin, whatever, just that thought. I think is already a little seed to just, yeah, like you said, open your mind a bit more and just think, or like, okay, is this true? Can I verify if it's true? You know, or. Do I choose not to verify if this is true and thus just trust other people that hopefully, you know, want to do stuff that benefits my life? <laughs> you know, that's, uh, <laughs> I don't know, like false hope or yeah. uh, pr- pretend hope. Yeah. I, I, what I always do in my life, um, is when I, when I hear something that I think might be true, then I kind of keep it in the back of my mind. And then as new information comes in, I kind of keep on evaluating the whole time. So then I can, if something happens in the future that kind of proves that or, 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 or um, goes along with that, with that, with, with a certain theory, then I kind of think, okay, oh, well, that, you know, that, that, that theory or that, what that guy said, yeah, that this proves it. And when it, when something comes along that this proves it or doesn't fit in with that theory, then I was like, oh, yeah, well, wait, let me adjust and, um, maybe that was nonsense. And I mean, with Austrian economics and with Bitcoin and with, all this stuff that, that basically that Safedin said, um, I always questioned that from mm. the beginning, but then as, as time goes on and as new facts come to light, that's, that always gets proven right <laughs> over, over time yeah. as, as you keep on evaluating in your own mind. And so I've, I've learned my lesson kind of like four times now. I mean, when Safedin says something, you can 
basically take that as, as truth <laughs> because, uh, because it might sound outlandish now, but it's probably going to not sound that outlandish in three years <laughs> from time from now. Well, um, I think he did, he did, of course, did really well with the book. Like he dissected every, every part left and right to, um, to show you that it, it could be different, right. And, and to show you what, what is wrong. But now, now that you think you understand Bitcoin, right? And eventually nobody really fully understands Bitcoin as, as an evolving thing, I would say. What, what is like a common misconception that you still wish to debunk? And in South Africa, basically the, the shit coins and the Bitcoin related scams have been devastating on the population. I'm, I would say, like eight out of 10 people that I know, um, have lost a lot of money on, there was a very large scam in South Africa called, uh, Mirror Trading International or MTI. And it was just basically a Bitcoin trading Ponzi scheme where they said that they had a, some algorithm that's trading Bitcoin and they give like 10% a month return. And, um, on, on top of that, it was, uh, a multi-level marketing scheme. So if you get someone else to invest, you get 10% of their mm -hmm. uh, 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 investment and 10% of their returns, basically. So this thing just blew up and obviously they never even tried it. <laughs> they, it was just a pure Ponzi, but instead of taking fiat, they took Bitcoin. Um, and when this, this whole thing blew up and they had uh, stolen like billions of rands and um, a lot of people lost money on that uh, in South Africa. Um, I mean, that was just one, but there was like a series of these scams, um, basically from 2016 to 2022. And unfortunately, a lot of people, I think maybe I'm speaking about South Africa now, but I think this is, um, is worldwide as well. A lot of people still think Bitcoin is a scam because they associate it with scams that has been running on top of Bitcoin, basically. So, I mean, that's the equivalent of thinking the dollar is a scam because Charles Ponzi ran a Ponzi scheme. It's it. Okay. Yeah. The dollar is a scam, <laughs> but, yeah. but, but not because, because of uh, 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 any scam related to, to, to people taking dollars. When people come to me and they say, no, but they lost money on, on, on this or that, or whatever um, um, scam project that, they, that they've lost money on. I always say to them, but uh, if there was a, uh, uh, some, some, some scam around, they were taking in sheep and giving out sheep as in return, and the whole thing crashed down and you lost like 200 sheep. Does that mean that sheep is a scam now? <laughs> <You know? laughs> I always try and explain it like that. <laughs> but, um, good point. That's but good yeah, one. it's, uh, I mean, I think that's very, very prevalent. Um, um, especially under boomers and, um, people of our generation as well. They've been a lot of people have, 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 um, dipped their toes and, um, they got burned. And, um, they try to stay away as from Bitcoin as far as possible, but whether they don't realize it, that it, it was never Bitcoin that scammed them. It was the individuals that they entrusted with their funds that they in initiative. Yeah. So is there a way you see Bitcoin adoption in South Africa evolving? Like, do you have this skepticism, but there's also, um, Bitcoin Ekazi and stuff like that. What? What do you think Bitcoin could bring to, to South Africa in that sense? I think, you know, um, if, if we can, if we can, if we can manage to, 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 to keep government regulation to a minimum in South Africa, um, regarding Bitcoin, it can bring a lot of, a lot of, um, prosperity. But, um, I mean, our government is very close to communism and they have already put in some, quite draconian laws. Um, and I've heard that they are planning to, to put in a law next year that will basically not allow people to self custody that you, so, so, so you, you can only basically keep your crypto, it, not only Bitcoin or crypto, basically only on regulated exchanges. And wow. that would kill off all, I mean, South Africa has seen a flourishing Bitcoin circular economy uh, movement. Um, yeah, like Bitcoin Ikasi, Bitcoin Vitsant. I mean, every, almost every town has a Bitcoin, um, a project going and a lot of Bitcoin charity, a lot of overseas donations and funds flying into South Africa. But unfortunately also, I mean, again, I think that people are susceptible to these laws because a lot of people have lost money on these scams that I just talked about now. So that might hinder, um, Bitcoin adoption in South Africa, but 
I think over the long term, it's, it'll only put us back a bit, but, um, I think the future is bright. Yeah. Yeah. I hope so too. I think, uh, well, we talked about this, but I think we, we are hopeful for the future in, in general. And I think, you know, like banning something like Bitcoin, I think only legitimizes it, right? Like why this is another way I think of thinking, I don't want to say differently because it's not that profound, right? But I think more people will wake up to what Bitcoin is, what once there are attempts by countries to, you know, ban it. Yeah. Why would you ban something that doesn't have value or is not, not interesting? Right. Or you could ask yourself, why is it such a threat? You know? Um, and of course exactly. they will, they will probably say like, it's to protect you from all the scams and stuff. You know, but uh, you know what's so funny? Because then people are going to be like, well, does the government actually protect uh, protect me from other stuff as well? And if that answer is no, then okay, but why why this thing then, right? So I think <laughs> there's some sort of, I don't know, like there there's this loop of questioning, like a questioning loop around Bitcoin that wherever you you start, you eventually end up, if you're curious enough, I would say, or maybe skeptical towards the current situation enough where you will be like, okay, maybe I should study what this is, right? In order to actually understand why my government would even want to ban this. Yeah. Uh, yeah. I mean, that, 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 that might have uh, that effect, but, um, it will definitely be, um, at least uh, weighed evenly or not, if not outweighed by the, but the lack of adoption through um, draconian laws and regulations. <clears throat> um, but yeah, that, um, uh, that's a battle that we're going to have to fight. I mean, we don't expect, uh, governments and central banks to lie over and, uh, just die without going to put up a huge fight because, uh, Bitcoin yeah. is a threat to their very existence and it, it's, it's going to be a battle, but, um, I think, I think it's going to be interesting. Yeah. Yeah. I definitely agree. I mean, this is. This should show people how big that battle is, right? Like the battle of battle for the money is, uh, is the ultimate power, right? Um, yeah. So are we giving it back to the, to the people, uh, and let them follow public rules or do we keep it with the rulers? Right. So I, I, I agree. It's a, it, it, it is, uh, it is bigger than you might initially think, I'd say, right? Like the, 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 the weight of the battle and the, and the and the size of the battle, yeah. Well, yeah. I mean, so the, the 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 game theory um, that I see playing out is um, there will definitely be countries with more draconian laws and banning Bitcoin or whatever, but there will definitely be countries that don't. And over a fifteen-year period, the countries that adopt Bitcoin will just outperform the other countries to such a vast extent that you'll have a basically a brain drain to those countries and the wealth drain. And, um, it'll basically the first to adopt will be the richest. And you can already see that in El Salvador. If mm -hmm. you just look at what, what I, I mean, the, the, the amount of growth that, that country has seen in the last four years must be like, it's unprecedented. If it keeps on going, we, we, they're going to be the richest country in the world within 15 years from now. They're going to be basically the next Singapore. So, um, I mean, that's not unrealistic. If, if, if they keep going at the rate that they're doing now, not even Bitcoin doesn't, the price of Bitcoin doesn't even need to go up for that to happen. Just, just the adoption and, and the, the new technologies and the new development and the, the capital flowing there, um, it's, in, it's insane. So, so you're going to have countries like that. And then you're going to have idiot countries like, uh, South Africa <laughs> who, um, who, who, who don't embrace it, who try to regulate it into oblivion. And those, those people, people in those countries are going to, going to suffer. Um, at least compared to the other countries. And yeah. that game th theory will play out very, very, very quickly. Yeah. Um, yeah, I agree. So, so, yeah, that's a, that's the message to, 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 I mean, if you love your own country, make sure you, 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 you're doing your part to, to, to have your government, um, be friendly towards Bitcoin adoption. Um, that's otherwise you'll, you're gonna have to move basically, um, soon. <laughs> Yeah, I agree. I think, uh, th there's so much information on the internet, right? Uh, uh, well, there's also a battle against that, by the way. Maybe that's, maybe that's part of it, but, 
the Bitcoin train is not stopping and people can inform themselves outside of any government attempt or propaganda, right? Uh, and I, I, I agree with you that that is, it's an individual uh, mind virus, I think, Bitcoin. Um, but it will play out, especially when there's going to be these big contradictions between countries who are friendly to it and who, who are hostile to it, right? Um, yeah, I, I wanted to switch the conversation to what you are building because, well, you went from normie to hardcore Bitcoiner and now you decided to also contribute to Bitcoin. I wanted to ask you what makes you, um, what made you decide to contribute to Bitcoin? And also can you share a bit about what you're building, which is called Air BTC? Yeah, so I, I wanted to, to, to start a, uh, a business that's 100% Bitcoin with no ties back to the fiat economy. And, um, I spent a lot of time researching and thinking about what, what kind of business I could, I could, could do that. And I came up with this idea. Um, so I mean, it's not rocket science. It's basically like a, a Airbnb or bookings.com or Verbo where people can list their properties and people can book their properties like short term rentals. And we only accept Bitcoin, um, payment from, from guests and we only pay out to hosts. And, um, so we're a hundred percent Bitcoin only <clears throat> and, um, we're a real world business. We're not a, um, almost all Bitcoin companies or other wallets or like some kind of fiat on an off ramp, um, whether it's an exchange or uh, vouchers or whatever they're selling. Um, so we're, connected to the real world in the sense of um, it's a real business with um, properties that people are letting and uh, uh, paying, but we're Bitcoin only. So um, yeah, we don't have a fiat bank account. And um, so far, the response from the Bitcoin community has been um, exceptional. I've been um, actually surprised by the amount of interest um, in this project. And it's been going very well. Um, we launched um, in July, in the middle of July, and we've been going just over a month now. And, um, I've had a, um, we have, we have like a, almost 150 listings now and a lot of more, um, listings to be uploaded and to be approved that's um, in the pipeline. And, um, we've already had three bookings as well. And yeah, I'm very excited. Um, just, um, I'm, I'm, I'm hoping that, um, this can be an example for, for other people out there to, to also start Bitcoin only businesses. Um, it does have its advantages, especially regarding, as we spoke just now about the regulation um, with large companies and businesses, the, the first thing that governments do to you to impose their regulation is uh, basically they threaten to close your bank account. Mm -hmm. um, so we don't have a bank account to close. <laughs> so I'm, I'm, I, it's going to be fun to see um, what they come up with. Um, I'm sure some jurisdiction will contact me soon <laughs> to, to, to try and impose some <laughs> some authoritarian rule onto me <laughs> and mm -hmm. um, I'm going to see what they're going to try and say, what they're going to try and do because um, their main weapon <laughs> um, won't work on me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Interesting. So why, why do you, what's your explanation for why it's important to, to also spend Bitcoin? So not only to, to hold it, but also to spend it. So I, um, I, I think that, um, to spend and replace or, um, basically buy to spend, um, fund yourself in Bitcoin to spend. I think that's a very important, um, meter for the Bitcoin community going forward. I think, um, stay humble and stack sats and hold to the moon and that kind of mentality, um, has been very valuable and true, um, basically for the last, uh, eight years. But, um, I think, I think that the, I think we need to, we need to shift our mindset, um, as a, as a community of Bitcoiners. We need to, we need to build a Bitcoin circular economy, um, that's strong. We need to, we need to get Bitcoin adoption. We need to get merchants to accept Bitcoin through the Lightning Network, especially. And, um, we need to get a circular economy in the world going that, um, runs on Bitcoin that's separate from the fiat regulation economy that, um, we've been talking about. And, um, I think that, um, people who are against that too, I, I, I've been getting a lot of negative comments from the community on, well, not a lot, but quite a few, um, on the AirBTC Twitter account, people who say, why would I spend my Bitcoin? Um, 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 I'll, I'll never sell my Bitcoins that I'm, I'm going to hold it until, uh, for 10 years and then I'm 
or whatever. And my answer to them is always, um, so in 10 years from now, are you planning to transfer your KYC free Bitcoin to a exchange and KYC them and then sell them and then spend the, the, that fiat? Or do you want to sell that Bitcoin um, for goods? Do you want to spend it basically into, into another economy directly? And I think not one of those people's answer will be that they want to, that they, that they're planning to, 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 um, um, <laughs> put their Bitcoin back on an exchange and sell it. Yeah. So if you don't want to do that, then we have to, you, you, you have to get merchants to start accepting Bitcoin. We have to, we have to start Bitcoin only businesses. We have to start a circular economy on Bitcoin only. And, um, you have to do your part. It's not that hard. Um, just basically, uh, support Bitcoin and the companies, um, get, uh, b- 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 become po- part of a Bitcoin project in your, in your local town or start one if there isn't one yet and onboard merchants and then go and support those merchants and platforms like here, BTC. <laughs> so yeah, I, I think, I think that's really important. And I, 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 I really do think that, um, that the mind shift of Bitcoin is, um, is shifting towards that and, I think, I think that's, that's going to be a, a huge topic in the next five years. Yeah. Well, I believe, I believe as well, if you can create this parallel economy that also anyone in the world, of course, can participate in, we can also show that as an example, um, of, of what we previously talked about. Maybe, you know, w- what my understanding is of capitalism is like a, a pure capitalistic, uh, economy where people try out stuff, right? They have a product or they have a service. And because the reward is Bitcoin, the product or the service has to be really good for people to uh, also spend their Bitcoin. So I think that incentive for for the, the supply side, right? The entrepreneurs, I think is really good because if you... If you have like a really high end or smooth, great experience with a, with a product or a service, um, that brings you, you know, the value that you're looking for, whatever it is, then yeah, it's, it's maybe nicer to, uh, to, to spend that Bitcoin on, but I think we'll see, right. I think it's really cool that you're experimenting, you know, already so early and just, you know, going for it and trying. Uh, to establish this as a legitimate, uh, you know, Bitcoin, Bitcoin only business. So I can only applaud that. Uh, I, I think, I, th- I think that's great. Do you like, what are your future plans? Like what, what, what do you envision where, where this is going to go or could go? At, at this stage, we're, we're, we're focusing on, on, on just getting, getting more listings and we're, we're, we're trying to create basically like pockets of areas where we have a lot of listings. So when people travel to those destinations, there's a, a row of, they know that they can book on Airbnb to see for, for that specific destination. And so we, we have, um, El Salvador, we have a lot of listings there and we've partnered with, um, the adopting Bitcoin conference, um, in El Salvador. And we are, um, they're an accommodation provider of choice. So if you're going to the conference, you can, you can bet on, uh, or, or, or book your stay on, on, on Airbnb to see. And then we're planning to, partner up with um, similar conferences and Bitcoin only events, areas where we know Bitcoin is, will travel to and got to try and get listings in those cities. Um, and then basically for every conference or libertarian or Bitcoin related event, we want to try and build our bookings or our listings around those areas where, where those events are and then try to get the guests um, to book through every to see. And then our second area of growth that I've seen, that I think can, can, is, has potential is, is Bitcoin circular economies around the world. So there's a lot of them popping up everywhere. I'm just actually, I'll, I'll find that tweet maybe and forward it to you, but, um, um, there's a map of all the di- different Bitcoin circular economies. And I, I see it like every few months, it pops up on my Twitter. And I remember like we got four years ago, there was like Bitcoin and Cassie and Tells on day, basically. And now there's, and then two years ago, there was like 15 or 20. Now there's like 150 different of these um, um, Bitcoin circular economy projects all over the world. And some of them are, are, are huge and the people driving them have a lot of passion and they're doing really hard work. So uh, we want to partner with these Bitcoin circular economy projects. Um, and we have an ambassador program where if you're running one of these um, circular economies in your town, you can become an ambassador and you can get uh, 10% of the, of the booking fee that we, uh, that we take. 
um, as, a, as a commission, basically, for all the listings that you sign up. So I think that that's like a win-win-win for us and for the for the circular economy and for that town. Because if if if, if someone lists their property in that town, then um, if someone books on Airbnb, then that Bitcoin goes directly into that property owner's um, hands, and they can spend that Bitcoin in the in that Bitcoin circular economy that they that 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 they're trying to to build. And then the guest that has booked on ABDC will also be a Bitcoiner. So they will tra- tra- travel there and they would also spend Bitcoin in the circular economy. And then also the commission that the Bitcoin circular economy um, member um, or ambassador gets will, they can use to, to, to uh, basically as funding for themselves to, mm-hmm. to build out their uh, economy project, their circular economy project. So, um, and then these circular economies can become like destinations of choice for, 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 for Bitcoin travelers. So those are the two, our two marketing strategies that we're, that we're working on. And then hopefully back in a um, couple of years from now, um, I'm hoping that um, we can establish a, such a good relationship with the Bitcoin community that Bitcoiners would basically use Airbnb to plan their holidays. They would rather than decide we want to go and then going to look for a place. To stay at that location, you would go to every see and see what nice places there are, and then basically book there to basically go on a Bitcoin holiday. Um, there's a lot of interesting um, Bitcoin only or Bitcoin themed um, properties that are on Airbnb already, and um, I mean I think we um, we we were a great um, marketing tool for those for those type of destinations as well. So I mean if you're a Bitcoiner and you're looking to go on a holiday, um, go go on there. There's this there's some stunning um, potential holiday destinations that's also by Bitcoiners for Bitcoiners um, that's listed already. Yeah, yeah, I che- I checked it out before we uh, before we recorded today, and uh, yeah, there's some awesome stuff on there. I will also link, of course, uh, in the, in the description uh, below uh, for for anyone who wants to uh, to check it out. But I think it's already pretty nice, right? You have these 150 spaces, so there is some some coverage already. Um, yeah, I mean, you're just starting out, right? And I think a platform like this is, uh, uh, you know, the well-known problem of a marketplace is, uh, is chicken and egg, right? So, and I'd say you have an edge because you focus on Bitcoin, right? If you would start another platform like this in the fiat world, I think it would be very, very hard to grow. But, uh, yeah, I think uh, this might be a differentiator compared to, to, to these others that, uh, that could definitely help you. So, uh, yeah, I'm excited to see, uh, I'm excited to see where it's going to go. Who, who are you building this with? Like, what is your, what is the team like? So at this stage, um, we have five team members. Um, it's me and then, um, my wife, uh, Mia, she's, uh, our operations manager. And we have a st- one staff member that helps her just, um, like with all the approval of the bookings and communicating with the uh, potential customers that the users. And we have a, 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 a guy in, in, in the U.S. Um, he's called Jake, uh, Jacob Seifert and he's in Orlando, Florida. And, um, he's, um, helping us on the, on the marketing side. And, um, he's like our head of business development. And Jake's been doing a really good job there. And then we have a developer that's working almost full time for us now. So that's our small team at this stage. And, um, hopefully we're going to grow that soon because we're all working our asses off, um, <laughs> on this whole project. And, um, I mean, it's just, just, just monitoring the site and communicating with hosts and getting listings up and making sure everything looks correct. It's, it's a huge, huge undertaking. And yeah. only with it, I mean, um, <laughs> we only have 150 listings. So, I mean, if, if I, I can't imagine, um, what it also is going to be if we have like uh, five or 10,000 listings one day, um, hopefully. But, um, so yeah, it's, um, at this stage it's tough, but, um, we've, we, we, we did just, um, 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 employ, um, one new team member to, to, to just, uh, help us take the edge off a bit. Yeah. Um, and yeah, we're, we're, we're constantly adding new features and upgrading the site, um, at a rapid pace. Um, but when we launched, it was very basic functionality. Um, and we've already added um, an incredible amount of new features and uh, bug fixes and stuff. And there's a lot more to come. We're constantly, constantly upgrading and working on that. So um, if you're um, listening to this and um, you go into the site and 
um, if there's any functionality or some advice, please get into contact with us. Um, the community feedback has been um, incredible and we've we're listening to it. We're, we're, we've implemented many of the um, requested features. And I mean, that's how you find out that, um, that w w what your customers want to, so you can deliver. Yeah. So, yeah. Of course. Well, I'll definitely be rooting for you. I wanted to ask you, uh, two, two final questions. So, you know, if this circular Bitcoin circular economy grows, adoption of Bitcoin grows. How do you think a world dominated by Bitcoin would look like? That's that, that, that is an interesting question. I, I think that for at, at least, um, for the, for, for the first period, like for the first 10 years, I, I think people who adopted Bitcoin earlier will be very wealthy compared to people who haven't. Um, but luckily that is also a self. I think many people see that as a big problem of Bitcoin, but that, that's a self-regulating function as well, because the whole thing, the whole reason why fiat billionaires and bank uh, executives stay rich is because they keep on printing new money. So as they spend the previous funds that they have, they just create new months, funds and spend that. So it's a never ending tap of funds flowing and that's, and they're in control of it. That's why they're rich. If you, if you're Bitcoin rich and you spend that Bitcoin, it's gone. And once you finish spinning it, um, you have nothing left. So, so that, 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 that problem, um, um, will sort itself out. But, um, and, and I think that, um, but I, th I think that, um, Bitcoiners and the, the general, um, outlook that we have on the world and the integrity and the general principles that Bitcoiners live by, I, I, I'm hoping that when Bitcoin has become wealthier that other people would see that and also adopt not only the Bitcoin, but also the kind of life principles, um, that, that, that come with it. And I think that might even be arguably, uh, if should that happen, uh, a, 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 a better, uh, a, a greater positive impact on society than, than the Bitcoin itself. Let's see if we're going to get there. I think uh, you, same as me, uh, are, are going to follow this uh, for the rest of your life, right? I think uh, for me, that's what's actually one of the reasons why I wanted to start the podcast when I realized, yeah, like the next 50 years, I'm going to be thinking about this thing every day. So why not contribute to it? I think, I think you are similar. <laughs> so I think, I think that's very cool. And, um, you know, We'll, we'll see where it ends, but I think, uh, yeah, what we talked about, we have a lot of, uh, we have a lot of hope for the future. I wanted to ask you my, my last question, which, uh, I ask uh, everyone the same question, which is what is a core belief that you will never let go? A core belief that I'll never let go. <laughs> I think a very important thing that uh, everyone should keep in, 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 in their minds is to never think that you're smart or that you know it all or that too little ego um, become too big. Um, I've personally seen many, many people fall from grace because they made it in their heads and then um, they become a different person. They think they're uh, smart and they know it all and they have a, their, their ego basically takes over. And um, within five to 10 years, they're uh, divorced and <laughs> bankrupt and some people even dead. Um, my father's generation, I, I can think of like 15 examples of people that I know personally, um, that that has happened to. And I think, you know, to, to, to be aware of that is very important. Um, especially for our generation now moving into the phase of our lives where we're going to basically be in control of the world. I'm, I mean, between 40 and 60, we're going to, our generation will be, um, uh, become much power, more powerful and all, all, all um, positions of power and executive companies and government positions will be filled with, um, people from, from our age. And I think we should look to the previous generation and see what they did wrong and, make sure that we don't make those same mistakes. Love that, man. Great, great answer to end this conversation. I want to thank you for your time. Really enjoyed it. And, uh, we'll stay in touch. Yeah, great. Thanks for having me. Keep well. Cheers.
I hope you enjoyed this episode. If you did, also make sure to check out this video right here or go to my page and check out all the episodes of Bitcoin for Millennials. I appreciate your support and hope to see you for another episode. Bye.